I'm really excited to be introducing you to our next guest. Um, General Charles McGee was one of the famed Tuskegee Airmen and a career officer in the United States Air Force for 30 years who flew a total of 409 combat missions in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. During World War II, Brigadier General McGee was stationed in Italy with the 302nd Fighter Squadron of the 332nd Fighter Group. General McGee, are you there? Do you want to... Do you want to introduce yourself? Good morning, and certainly a pleasure to be here to share because of the, I realize that teachers have a real challenge this day and age because there's so many things that are out there for youngsters to focus on, and if we can keep them on the right track, that's what's good for the country. So it's a pleasure to be able to share with you t today. Definitely. Do you want to introduce us a little, introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about your story? Oh, well, <laughs> I'm Charles Edward McGee, Brigadier General of the United States Air Force, retired. Um, I ended up doing something I enjoy doing, and I like to pass that on to the young folks as you find your talents, pinpoint what you enjoy doing uh, along the way. But, but I, I was hooked after my first flight. For some reason, it struck me in a way. And, and then what followed is, is, again, I don't have the answer. I sometimes say, why me, how me, I don't know. But I got wonderful assignments and was able to actively fly 27 of my 30-year Air Force career. So, as I say, I was hooked after the first, first flight. But I also got involved uh, um, just before integration uh, under the Air Force. Um, they said, well, you have to do something else besides flying. Some went to intelligence school, weather school, so on. I chose to go to the aircraft maintenance school. So along the way, besides enjoying flying, I was active in material and maintenance support as, as well. So. I had a well-rounded career, as I say, one I enjoyed every, every minute of it, and uh, I like to pass that on. And I know to be able to share with teachers across the country is, is so important. You have a great task, as I see it today, because there's so many other things thrown at kids or in front of them or, or you have to get their mind off of so that they <laughs> focus on the right right thing. So it's wonderful to be able to share with you, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Definitely. Um, I'm going to be reading some of the questions that are coming in from our teachers um, for you to answer. So I'll Good. tell you, I'll tell you who, said, who asked it and then read the question. So from Richard Vanden Bosch, in the midst of the racial tension of today, what advice do you have for the nation as it attempts to reconcile the discrimination of the past and present with the hope of moving forward as one semi-unified nation? My goodness, that, that's getting pretty deep into things and into politics and so on. Um, but really, uh, when I look at where we've been, what we've accomplished and where we're going, Money, to me, is our big, biggest problem. Uh, for too many years, improvement or, or advancement was just measured in increased bottom line dollars. And that leaves, unfortunately, so many of the Americans that we have today. And, and of course, this gets into an Im immigration policy and, and all. How many people can the country support and, and it's unfortunate that, that it's almost like a caste system. There are those with money and do whatever and there are just so many hundreds and hundreds of people in poverty. How we can overcome that, I, I don't have the answer, but I think it's certainly something that uh, needs to stay on the agenda because someday it's got to be solved or or we won't improve as time goes on. We just keep moving on, but stay the same. Still so many people not able to participate in the way they would, not prepared to 
enter into the jobs that are there. There's, it, it's, it's not an easy question to, to answer, and there's probably no one way. <laughs> there is a way, and hopefully we have the folks coming along in, in policy positions that understand that and, and focus on it. Definitely. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. Um, I know it started you off with a with a tough one. <laughs> um, but okay, the next one is from David Trail, and he says, please describe how evident racism was among the locals when you trained in Tuskegee. Well, that's very interesting. And of course, many folks don't know that uh, the problem came from a 1925 War College study, and the subject of that study was use of Negro manpower if America gets involved in another war. Um, paragraph four of that four page report that was sent to Washington says the Negro is physically qualified, the Negro is mentally inferior to the white man, the Negro is morally inferior to the white man. The Negro would not even follow his own leadership uh, effectively. Um, and certainly uh, segregation was part of that policy. They didn't want any Negro in the position that a white soldier had to salute them, et cetera. This was sent to Washington to be a part of future mobilization policy. And uh, it, it's, it's interesting because they... They claim they've studied the issue, know that any such effort to put blacks in aviation would be a failure uh, and should not be, be, be attempted. But it's interesting, they, they didn't pay any attention to the black soldiers that went to France and fought with the French, were highly decorated and rewarded for, for, for their service. They didn't pay any attention to a young black American Bessie Coleman, who in 1920 went to France to get a license and came back going around the country barnstorming. Certainly, she was interested in this new industry of aviation and blacks or whites that would come out to the airfield to see her perform, put on a show. And, and as I say, her barnstorming was introducing this new industry of aviation to, to, the, to, to the country. That was the circumstance since at the time. And it's interesting uh, that when uh, our country de declared war against Germany and later against Japan, uh, our country was coming out of 10 years of depression and it the action didn't change segregation, but they did open some doors of opportunity. The jobs that were in the industry build up uh, and so on. And so there were blacks very interested in, in flying, <clears throat> and, uh, but that door was closed. It, it's interesting, uh, in 1939, they established a civilian pilot training program and this was at colleges around the country. And, and this program would provide a pool of pilots that our military could call on to meet, meet their need as, as the war, war, war went on. Um, Tuskegee Institute in uh, Tuskegee, Alabama, had a very successful civilian pilot training program. And it, it's interesting that uh, the a law was passed allowing the uh, the uh, army to contract the primary phase of their flight training to a civilian pilot training program. This would save their experienced pilots to fill the units actively participating in the war. Tuskegee Institute applied and got a contract. So even though the policy was, we can't fly, my first instructor was a black pilot from their, their program. And all of this is, is so interesting. It shows, I guess, the dichotomy of the yeses, the noes, the non-believers, those believers, 
it was all out there, but applied in so many different ways. And so why are we called Tuskegee Airmen now? Because the overall policy of main, <clears throat> maintaining segregation, although the, the Army said it won't be successful, they allowed <clears throat> the training to, they first, <clears throat> excuse me, they first uh, approved uh, the one squadron, the 99th Pursuit Squadron, later changed to 99th Fighter Squadron. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting because part of that Army policy, although there were blacks getting their early flight training in the civilian pilot training program, um, in fact, I believe it was in Washington, D.C., one of the graduates from the CPT uh, um, went door and said, I want to be in the Army pilot, and said, oh, we can't use black pilot because we don't have any black mechanics. So of the now called Tuskegee Airmen, I would say the first were the mechanics, and it was because of their training that I even learned about, about the program. I was at, uh, enrolled at the University of Illinois in the engineering program, but uh, the mechanics were entered into training at the tech school, Chanute Field, Rantoul, Illinois. That's 14 miles away from the university. And of course, we learned something's going on because they got blacks in training up there. They were expected to fail. In fact, they were even tested twice because the first didn't believe that, that they could get scores like they did in, in, their, in the te test program. They were successful, and then the Army said, wow, we need an Air Force for the pilot training. Air Forces, I mean, bases all around the country. They found $4 million to build Tuskegee Army Airfield for the training. So the, of the now called Tuskegee Airmen, the first were really the mechanics. They were successful a few months uh, after the the field became available, the uh, pilot training began, and although the 99th, their pilots and their mechanics were trained and, and ready for combat, no white commander wanted them. They, as I say, they started training in 41, December 42, they're combat ready. They kept them in training another three or four months before finally sending them to North Africa, but signed to the uh, fighter group. But Colonel Mumwire didn't want them, so segregation went overseas. They went to their own base. They sent an officer over to the, the third, third group's location, got their assignments, came back and flew. But Mumwire's report were told you they weren't aggressive and successful. They only shot down one aircraft. Ought to be patrolling Liberia. Well, that's a challenge to your studies. Where's Liberia? Where were the Germans? Well, I think you understand. In other words, get out of the way. And, but uh, that brought a hearing in Washington. From that hearing, uh, they said, well, only been in combat at times around, but the research on the hearing said, well, their bombs on target were the same as the others there, stay in combat. So the 99th moved out of North Africa into Sicily, out of Sicily into Italy. Well, in the meantime, training continued at Tuskegee, and three additional single-engine fighter squadrons were trained. The, 100, the 301st, and 302nd squadrons. I became a member of the 302nd. But the 332nd fighter group, all of us were trained in the P-40 and ready for combat in the P-40. But they said, oh, you are going to do some patrol work. And we were switched to the P-39 Bel Air Cobra went directly to Italy at the same time the 99th was moving out of Sicily into Italy. They were attached to the, I believe, another, another fire group, I think 79th or 75th, my memory's 
not serving me exactly well for that. But but I say a little bit of integration went over because Colonel Bates of the group they were assigned to was just glad to have more pilots and more aircraft. And over the Anzio Beachhead, 99th Flying with the 79th Flying Group shot down several German aircraft. So it was a matter of opportunity. Uh, but at this same time, the 332nd was patrolling Naples Harbor and the waterways up the coast to the Anzio Beachhead. But it's in the spring of, of 44 is when we realized that uh, uh, our bombers, although we thought they had enough guns on the B-17s and 24s to, to protect them from the German Air Force, that wasn't happening. And with each aircraft lost, that was 10 American lives lost. So with this, we were all working for 12th Tactical Air Force. Um, this was, Four squadrons were moved to 15th Strategic Air Force we gave our P-39 to the Russians because the 332nd Friday Group was one of the four, and uh, we picked up P-47 Thunderbolts and began the escort work with the Thunderbolt. Had it about three months, and then all four groups were flying P-51 Mustang. So that was a wonderful aircraft, although it was built for the British. Uh, when they put the Rolls-Royce engine in it, we said, perfect, <laughs> we'll, use it. we'll use it too. So, but that's the early history of, of the training and, and, and start there at, at Tuskegee. And of course, uh, in fact, when I graduated in June of 43, my instructor, the white instructor, um, said, it's too bad they don't have a bomber program for you guys. I think you'd make a good bomber pilot. I didn't ask him what he meant. <laughs> but uh, he didn't know, nor did I, that they had already approved, and three months later, medium bomber training Mitchell B-25 began at Tuskegee Army Airfield, 477th Bomb Group Medium. And what's interesting that... I'm not sure everybody realizes that because of segregation, in each case it said, and all of the necessary support. So the support uh, for for a squadron, a uh, couple hundred technicians of all of the skills required, but they also needed medical supply administration, and so there were others. So that's another couple hundred hundred people. So although the program finally produce some 900 pilots. We're talking 13, 14,000 support people that also became a part of, of, of what, what took place. Wow. Thank you so much. That was, that was so much great information. Um, the next question is from Patricia Hay, Patty Hay, and she's asking you to please share with us your four Ps. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, in talking to young folks, I like to pass on the value lessons to them because they're our country's future. And somewhere along the way, I found that uh, four Ps uh, kind of covered the, not the waterfront, but enough for them to be on track. And that was perceive, prepare, perform, persevere. What do we mean by perceive? Oh, dream your dreams. Find what, your, get a, find what your talents are. And, and I always like to add, and hopefully among is something you like to do. Like I fell in love with aviation. Hopefully there's a lot. You don't want to go to work every day, but not like what you're having to do because you weren't prepared for others. But prepare. Get a good education. I, I like to add, learn to write and speak well, but develop those talents th that you had. Perform. Always do your best in everything that you do and always have excellence that's your goal. That's what's important for country, country's future. And persevere. Don't let circumstances be an excuse for not achieving. We could have bowed our head and said they called me names, they don't like me, say I can't do something, gone off, not serve the country. But what would that have accomplished? Our performance 
brought, helped bring about a change to the country as, as years passed, providing equal access and equal opportunity for all. But uh, that came about. The Army never changed their policy. Even though all through the war, the war ending in 45, in 1947, the Air Force separated from the ground forces and uh, their studies said we need to use people based on training experience and where needed, not to happenstance of birth, if you, if you will. And, and we're not getting enough money to keep a base open, but limited because of segregation on signing and meeting our responsibilities. We need to integrate. They were back to few months later by a very courageous President Harry Truman, who issued executive order, actually. Well, he issued two. 9980 mandated there should be equal access throughout the federal, in hiring throughout the federal government. 9981 mandated all of the services need to integrate. Well, the Air Force finally carried out there that it takes time. Uh, 19, June of 1949, closed the segregated base. And actually, the Air Force led the country in that equal access and equal opportunity and providing for, for all. Yeah. Thank you. Um, from Cindy Stilwell, where were most of your flights to and from? When we went to Italy, uh, our early flying was from an airfield uh, near, um, oh my goodness, the name wants to slip away from me, in, in southern Italy. Um, and uh, then uh, later we moved to the Adriatic side uh, near the Foggia of Italy, and that's where we did the escort were from, from the Foggia area of Italy. The bombers had moved out of North Africa into southern Italy. We were just north of them, so we, as they took off and formed up, we could join, meet them and join them at a designated areas they flew toward their uh, targets. And that, of course, was north to, well, from, from Italy and northwest to southern France, due north all of Germany, and then, and, and of course, eastern Czechoslovakia, and all the way over to the Anzio Beach in, uh, in Romania. So that was the setup at the time from, from, from bases in, in Italy, but that prime base was uh, in the Foggia area of, of Italy. Great, thank you. Um, from David Trail, he asks, what selection criteria were there for the Tuskegee Airmen when you joined? Selection, that's interesting. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sh sure I have, have the answer uh, the selection process. I like for myself, as I say, I was in school. I learned of the mechanics training, and I think my old TC instructor said, "Well, you ought to be a pilot." Uh, I went and passed the pilot exams and got called in. Um, in in well, it was in the spring of, of '42. In October, I got a call and entered the pilot training direct as a cadet. I think probably because of my ROTC training, I didn't go, have to go to boot camp or <laughs> any other introduction. So it, it, may, it may have varied. Uh, some applied, some had to go through uh, fr from early Army training and then were transferred to the, to the Air Force. But, 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 it, but it varied, and uh, I guess you would say it, it was your desire and willingness and not so much what uh, was required. But in that early day, they did require college study, even for the mechanics. By the time, as the war progressed, finally you could enter even with a high school graduate. But the, earlier you had to be a college graduate. It ended up high school graduate 
could go get into the aviation. Okay, thank you. Um, from Stephen Preswara, um, did you or any of your fellow Tuskegee Airmen ever have second thoughts about fighting for a country that treated you as second-class citizens? Oh, there may be a son that were always upset over treatment <laughs> and what took place, but uh, I think the majority of us were glad for the opportunity and, and uh, were glad to just say, your saying I can't do it didn't, wasn't the, the fact. It was given the opportunity, and of course, along the way, we had good leadership because there were those who believed in the opportunity and assured that we were granted that opportunity. And fortunately, uh, we, with the leadership that we had, uh, proved that that was not only good for the circumstances but good for the country, and 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 became part of the policy that uh, did not color the skin or how you cut your hair that's important, but it's what's in your brain and, and your ideas and your thoughts and uh, that, that, that are important. And of course, that's where the you teachers all come in because you're, you know, I, I, sometimes I tell the students, uh, you know, you've got the greatest computer ever built. It's your brain. But if, if you don't monitor your computer and do it right, you don't get results. That's important in your studies. If you don't develop your brain and and use it right, you're you're the one that's hurt. And and of course, if you don't do your best and do things along the way, uh, well, you're you're hurt. Your family's hurt. Your family, the community, and if the community's hurt, the country's hurt. So it's a, it's something that. Uh, all youngsters need to be uh, aware of, of the importance of their progress along the way is important for our country. Definitely. Um, from Eric Ertman, um, can you describe your missions during World War II and did you have many close calls? Oh, wow. Well, the mission was uh, around camp, it was lights out around nine o'clock, but Around six o'clock in the morning, you got a wake up call, um, little exercise, a little breakfast. Uh, then you're briefing on the mission for the day. And from the briefing, you go get your equipment together. And then you go to the flight line and talk with your mechanic and check your aircraft over. And everything was focused on a start engine time for fighter pilots because that was based on how much time it take you to climb to altitude and 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 join the uh, bombers at the rendezvous point. So all of this was planned by operations, part of your briefing, and and uh, that's what you prepared prepared to meet e each day uh, that you were assigned to be flying. Great, thank you. Um, okay, here's a a fun question from Lisa Gibson. Having flipped the coin at the 2020 Super Bowl, who is your favorite football team? Well, at the point, I didn't have a favorite, but yet, on uh, the other hand, uh, I have retired from a base near Kansas City and spent many years of, of, of my uh, non-service time in Kansas City, Missouri, so it's, it was kind of home. So although I wasn't flipping it to, for hoping that the Chiefs would win, uh, certainly the way it ended up in the course of the early part of that game, it didn't look like they were going to, but they did. So I, I was happy with that. But I didn't enter or flip the coin with, with hopes at the time that either one would be the successful team. Understood. Very fair. Um, from Jennifer Masood, at the time, did you realize the significance of being a part of the Tuskegee Airmen? And what were your thoughts about that? No, um, as I say, I was just a happy camper along the way uh, because I fell in love with flying and had, had, had wonderful assignments. But uh, we didn't enter the uh, 
war saying we're going to go down and set the world on fire and do something. We were just glad to be able to participate uh, with what the country is doing to support our allies as in Europe. Uh, and and uh, to me, that was what there were some that uh, had always wanted to be a pilot and were glad to be a part of it. Others just glad that we had an opportunity to serve our country in a time time of need. So that there were mixed mixed feelings there. There were some who served and got out of the service as soon as they could after the war was over. Others like myself, um, getting wonderful assignments and opportunities, remained, and, and that's why I ended up with thirty years of service. Yeah. Um, Hope Myers has a follow-up to that question. Did fellow pilots in the Vietnam War respect you more knowing that you were part of the Tuskegee Airmen? Uh, I don't think that was the case at, at, the, at the time because um, there were still many in the leadership that uh, weren't for integration. Uh, there were still those who believed in that policy that was <laughs> for it and, and, and that uh, uh, we, we weren't, weren't capable or shouldn't have, have, have the opportunity. Um, but as I say, fortunately, uh, and I, I think I mentioned, because of this, in the, those years of the war from um, 41 to 45, the Army never changed the policy. Um, it took the Air Force, it, it separated two years later, 47, to uh, um, separate from, from the ground forces. Um, and and uh, so change like that uh, in their areas still they're facing uh, today, whether it's happenstance of birth or where you come from or and, and that type of thing, and the immigration policies that we have. So similar questions are still here for us to face and, and hopefully do, do, do the right, right thing about, and that is, um, I'd say, equal access and equal opportunity for all. And certainly, uh, again, as far as the future is concerned, I'd salute the teachers because you play such an important part of every youngster, and 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 that's a challenge today because all our schools even aren't the same, and some of our schools are still graduating students, but they're not really quite prepared, and and again, this is something we can do something about, and hopefully, we're needed that that action will take place, but but in reality realize that isn't the case so we can't give up if you give up you're lost already <laughs> so we have to keep focus on 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 the, the goal and wh what it means for the country and for the country's future definitely thank you um here's a question from brianne wagter she asks was the double v campaign particularly influ influential or motivational for you or other members of your unit uh for some wondering what the double double v meant i think it was our pittsburgh courier newspaper who put out an article that we were flying for two victories two v's Victory against Hitler in Europe, uh, and, and of course later against Japan, and victory against against racism, um, because uh, it became a focus for our bomb group in in their training at, at the, one of their bases, uh, Seymour base. Uh, the commander wanted to maintain segregation. He didn't want the, the crewmen of the 477 bomb group, but he didn't want officers entering the officers club. He wanted to keep that white. He didn't want the chance of black officers and, and wives and others, uh, uh, white women, 
uh, didn't want the officers to enter the club. Um, so he put out a, he had General Hunter's okay for base regulation, even though it was against army policy, uh, saying that uh, trainees on his base could only use the facilities he designated. Uh, entering the club was not for trainees. They had to use such and such a building. Knowing that that was contrary to Army <coughs> regulations, um, the officers of the 477th Bomb Group uh, peacefully in twos and threes went to the club, were denied access. Um, Colonel Selway called them in and said, uh, I'd like you to read, reread my regulation and sign this paper that you will abide. 101 refused because they knew what Army regulations specified at the time, and the, their dues were already taken out of their pay. Um, uh, they refused to sign, were shipped off from Seymour and based in Indiana to Godman Field, Kentucky, behind barbed wire, guards, and so on, treated worse than German prisoners of war that debate Jason Fort Knox. Um, so that, that's, that brought a hearing. The hearing, I don't know where they sent Selway, but the Army never changed their policy. The war was over by this time, 332nd part of the groups back. Uh, Godman feels not the place for the unit. Um, and that's when they opened up Selfridge Field uh, south of Columbus, Ohio, uh, as a segregated base. And, and uh, that was the base that finally the Air Force closed in 49 when they ended the, the segregation pro program. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, all right, the next question is from Ben V. What are some important things we should be teaching our students about being good citizens and what it means to be an American? Very interesting question because um, good students and, and enjoying the freedoms that we so much enjoy here in America are not available in many parts of the world. Um, is a challenge that all should be preparing themselves to not only continue to enjoy, but, but uh, live them in their, their life and actions to, to the point that uh, it's not your happenstance of birth or how you fix your hair that's important, but it's how you as a person uh, react with others and with, with, with your own, own life. Uh, and i like to add that uh, you should all be look at the positive side of things, the good side of things. Uh, I think there's an old saying, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, and don't mess with Mr. in between. But, but it's these types of values that, that are so important and certainly hope Although we know uh, uh, teaching is from the book and certain, uh, the various elements uh, along the way, our, our actions need to speak to these other values that are so important to, to, to the future. Definitely. Thank you. Um, okay, from Hope Myers. How much of a voice did you have in military aviation's evolution? For example, did you have an en engineer's ears when saying how the engines could be improved? Uh, along the way, as I mentioned, that, that I had, uh, as a second part of my career, gone to aircraft maintenance officer school, um, I was able to uh, participate uh, uh, when they started the what they call maintenance control effort, which was an office that looked at what was going on and assured that the units at that particular base had the 
right equipment or equipment they needed and so on to have keep the aircraft active and go, and going uh, able to participate in that type of thing so along the way there were opportunities to see where things were and make help make recommendations that improved the maintenance or maintenance support that units uh, throughout the uh, services receive. Thanks. Thank you. Um, from Ron Eisenman, was there any specific incident or experience which led you to be so deeply patriotic? I don't think there was someone uh, uh, Again, that leads to what I said earlier. I've often asked, why me, how me? Uh, I didn't ask for any assignment that I got. Uh, at one time, they had a preference statement, and at the time, my preference was, I'd like to be stationed on the West Coast. Never happened in all of my service. All of my assignments were in the central part of the country, so I ended up uh, retiring from rich and became the commander of Richard Skabar Air Base and retired in, in uh, ni 1972. Um, so it, it, it was happenstance and, and not, not by <laughs> direction, but certainly my training school along the way, there were a number of uh, school opportunities I was able to participate in. And as I say, I've, I just feel like a, a, a lucky guy because I got assignments that added to my career experience and later career responsibilities. And uh, fortunately, uh, education and all along the way, I was I was successful. So um, I, I was a happy camper, <laughs> as I say, uh, uh, along the way because of that. And, and on the other side, uh, I don't recall, I didn't have a mentor or, or somebody along the way that said, uh, oh, McGee's the guy for that, McGee's the guy for that. But it happened, and, and fortunately, successful uh, career, and, and I was able to serve with a, a lot of people and and. Uh, and my leadership and so on paid off along the, along the way. Yeah, just important to be ready for the opportunities when they come, right? <laughs> exactly, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, from Richard Vandenbosch, what was the most harrowing of the 137 combat missions you flew? Well, it's 136 in, in uh, Europe. Um, and then later 100 in Korea and 173 in Vietnam. But but uh, I didn't look at any being more serious, if you will, than, than the other. Uh, many depended on the, the circumstance of the enemy's positions at the time or the number of guns that might be protecting an area. Um, Certainly, uh, it, it's very interesting. Um, I can remember even I, of my 136 missions, and although I had a victory over a Falk Wolf in w World War II in Korea, uh, in those, I had no aircraft damage myself in World War II. Korea, I realized that one time, I'm firing on a gun emplacement, uh, trying to keep our troops from crossing a valley, and somebody's firing back at me. <laughs> and my plane was hit, but fortunately it was out in the wing, and um, I was able to get back to my home base. And, and of course, the plane had to be completely replaced. Um, Vietnam, uh, again, Another phase of, and I, I put my flying experience in there. World War II was um, air superiority flying. Korea was interdiction ground support flying. Never saw a MiG because they weren't down in the trees where we were. Vietnam tactical intelligence. 
we carried no weapons and speed was our defense. But again, uh, had an aircraft hit, fortunately was out in the wing, not the cockpit. I wasn't able to get the plane. I was too far from home base to get back to home base, but made it to a safe base. And But this is all a part of what we were trained, prepared, and part of our mission briefing to meet, meet such an occasion. And uh, I was just thankful that all of mine were ended up safely yes and we all are too <laughs> thank you that's very kind <laughs> um from monica pohovich um she says teaching students to persevere is so hard it doesn't if it doesn't work the first time they want to give up do you have any tips on encouraging them not to give up uh, that's one of the things we can say in part, part of persevere don't let somebody believe in someone tells you you can't do something. You have to believe that you can and, and go for it. Uh, as, as I say, remain positive in all of your thinking. You know, be aware of the negative, but don't focus on it. Uh, it's... Not an easy thing, I'm sure, for, for youngsters with what they're facing. So many uh, things happening out there that they don't need to give attention to. There's um, the communications today is, is so different. It uh, doesn't come from the radio at home. It comes from almost everybody with a, a phone in their hand and and. Now they're being bombarded with uh, a lot of things that don't the youngsters don't need, but they can't can't avoid it because they've got a phone and 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 these they, these things come. So again, it's it's a challenge to, to the te you teachers to uh, hopefully help steer their mind away from attention to all of those as I say negatives that that. Uh, Come, come before them and and realize what what's important uh, in in their training is as as each year goes by. Definitely. Um, from David Trail, can you describe what it was like to fly um, in in the single seat fighter during in World War II on long missions? And also, what was the relationship like between the pilots and the maintenance men of the Tuskegee Airmen? Yeah, very, very interesting. Well, the, our training, as I say, we were trained as single-engine engine fighter pilots. So, um, it, it's your training prepares you to meet the mission types that that, that you're assigned and and. Certainly, our focus. It was so important to uh, um, share with your mechanic because, uh, and in the, the course of the way we did that before, take, take we had a takeoff time, but backing off from that was time to walk around the aircraft, check it out, and and determine uh, the mechanic what he the work that had been done on it and how he felt the condition of the aircraft was very key people. I used to say that you reporters need to occasionally talk to the mechanics that make it possible for what we pilots do and not always just talk, talk, to, talk to the pilot. Uh, very, very key uh, because the condition of the aircraft that uh, you start up when you meet your engine start time uh, was important. So we were a very close relationship. Uh, and uh, I was lucky enough to, uh, some 40 years after the war ended, to meet again and share with uh, my mechanic, uh, Nate Wilson, before he passed on. But indeed a very important relationship that that you shared because it meant so much and and it was a challenge to our, each of our preparation although we read the tech order and understand but 
passing on when you come back from a mission, the mechanic things that had happened or the conditions for the performance helped him do his job on the, on the ground and preparing for, for the next mission. So it, it's, it was a wonderful relationship um, that developed and certainly an important one uh, uh, along the way. Definitely. Um, all right, so just as a warning to you and to everyone, I think we're going to take about two to three more questions and then we'll wrap up. But um, the next question is from Adam Cat, and he asks, throughout your career in the Air Force, what type of aircraft did you enjoy flying the most? Oh, <laughs> well, all of them were, were, were good. Certainly, uh, yes, old fighter pilot. P-51 with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine was tops in the day and time. And then you, you have to be per careful with comparisons. Ending up in the F-4, and after I retired, I got a chance uh, to get an F-16 ride. And somebody said, how do you compare? And I said, you don't. <laughs> uh, because, but this is what technology has, has done for us. Certainly in that early day, there were many things that the pilot did by hand. Later on, it was done automatically. Uh, um, you know, we were given to bomb the runway. And later they said, what part of the runway or what section do you, do you want hit? Uh, bomb the building. You want it down the smokestack or at the other end of the building? Technology has changed that picture uh, along the way and certainly, again, is a challenge and also sure one of the challenges for teachers as you look at bringing youngsters along, realizing that you can only in the time that you have them just touch the idea that technology is ever out there and ever changing. Um, it's a real challenge. <laughs> certainly, certainly. All right, um, from Brianne Weichter. I, she says she finds that students learn really well if they are able to touch some kind of artifact or sample. Are there any objects that you kept from your service that have important value to you? What are they and why are they important to you? Well, comparing service and training of my day to the training today, there, there isn't a you, you really can't compare, they're, they're, they're very different, but as I say, this is because of where technology has taken us as, as over the years, uh, and the challenge uh, to each of the youngsters that you have in your classrooms today is much greater, I feel, than it was to me 75, 80 years back uh, when I was in, in school. We, ha we have to recognize that, but again, it's, it's a big challenge to teachers to get the youngsters head in the right direction for them to understand that, that uh, they've got to absorb, I think, a whole lot more than we did to be able to accomplish the missions, missions assigned. But it's because where technology is taking us, it's because the advancements that have come about and it's a challenge of what's what's in the future like uh, the saying right now to the young ladies one of you is going to be a lady going to the moon who knows who's going to mars but that's all i tell the youngsters training we're training to go to mars oh yeah no, there are i said guess what when the training is completed, I think those planners are all going to be too old. It's going to be one of you making, making that trip. We wish everybody one the best as you prepare for it, but certainly I salute each and every one who's teaching a youngster today because of it's, what that means, not only for the youngster's future, for the future of our country. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to share with you. And as we say, best of good wishes, stay safe, and God bless America. Thank you so much, Colonel, Mc I mean, General McGee. Sorry, your promotion. General McGee, <laughs> sorry. Um, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your story with all of us. Um, I know we're all very appreciative of it.
Thank you for that. All the best and stay safe.